Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Brian Schottlander, the university librarian here at uh, UC San Diego, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all this afternoon. Um, I am privileged this afternoon to be uh, joined by um, my colleagues and co-hosts, um, the Chicano Latino Arts and Humanities Program and its director, Jorge Mariscal, who's sitting here to my right, uh, and the Diversity Committee of the Librarians Association of UC San Diego. Um, and I can't, say, I can't say enough how pleased we are uh, to welcome you all to this very special celebration this afternoon. I say celebration, and I mean it. Um, we're here to celebrate the life and achievements of Cesar Chavez and to officially announce the UC San, Diego's li UC San Diego Library's uh, very recent acquisition of the Digital Farm Worker Movement Documentation Archive, uh, also known as the Farm Worker Movement Documentation Project, led by Leroy Chatfield. Uh, we're very excited about um, adding this unbelievably rich digital resource to the library's holdings um, because we have spent, uh, with the help of Jorge and his colleagues, the last several years documenting the Southern California experience in general and the Latino Chicano experience in particular. And we feel that this resource will be a wonderful addition um, to the content that we have and will fuel additional research and teaching related to the farm workers' movement. Buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Um, it's a great joy for me to be here today, uh, given that not only are we announcing the UCSD acquisition of the archive, but we have two of the key players in the farm workers' movement with us today. And later on, when the lights are back on, Please check out the photographs um, of Roberto Bustos and, and Leroy Chatfield just a few years ago <laughs> when they were active uh, with Cesar Chavez and Helen Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And um, uh, uh, Rosario Dawson was not there. Uh, some of you will understand what I mean by that. But how many of you have seen the movie Cesar Chavez? OK, that's, that's not good for the movie makers. <laughs> but. Um, so um, we're, we're in a moment as we sit here today when there's a Hollywood movie uh, of Caesar's life. There are several new books out. There are several new documentaries. And there's really been, for a few years, a kind of revisionist history being written of this movement, um, not all of it very flattering. And uh, I think one of the great things about this archive is it lets all of you and anybody with any interest in this subject matter in the world to go into the documentation themselves and read the words of the principal players and look at the photographs and watch the videos, watch, watch Cesar Chavez in action, um, giving a class in Montreal on organizing and, and see what he's doing as a teacher, right? And then you weigh the facts and you decide what the meaning of this wonderful social movement was. Um, and so that's, to me, what the archive is. It's a research tool. It's a teaching tool. And in a former life, Leroy was a teacher. Um, Brian has suggested he's an amateur librarian. To me, he's an organizer. What, what you have to realize is what leads us to today is he organized me, and then I organized Brian, right? <laughs> and he organized his staff. And that's how things get done, um, not just from sheer passion or emotion, but by very rational organizational strategy. So that's what leads us to today. And I, I can't thank Brian enough for being open immediately to this idea. Um, to be honest, we had spoken to other libraries at other universities, and they weren't, they didn't understand the meaning of this as quickly as Brian did. So we want to thank you very much for that. Give it up for Brian. Please. Librarians don't get applause that often. <laughs> All right, so it's my honor today to introduce to you um, Roberto Bustos, who will tell his story to you. Um, part of our event today is having Leroy interview Roberto, and I think this in itself is a historical landmark, um, to hear the story of Roberto Bustos, who, if you notice in the photographs, was the leader, the lead organizer 
for the 1966 March on Sacramento, um, as I understand it, handpicked by Caesar to be that captain of the march, and he'll tell you more about that. So it's a great honor to meet him. And then, of course, Leroy, who uh, both he and his wife worked with the union for many years. Um, Leroy just told me on the way here today from the airport that his wife, Bonnie, was this union school teacher, essentially, and taught all of Caesar and Helen Chavez's uh, children when they were young, young children. So um, their history with the union goes way, way back and very deep. Um, we're going to begin the proceedings now with a short film clip about the march to Sacramento. So I'm going to put that up now. separate family of farm workers. And then from there it was the next town and the next town and the line kept growing and little bands of, of farm workers would join us along the way. And there was this immense feeling of solidarity, you know? Like we're not alone, you know? What do you know, we're not alone. There are a lot of people that know what's going on in Delano. Farm workers. They'd pick up the little flags, you know, and wave them and march with us. And just seeing that line grow was, was fantastic. Or walking along a freeway. If you'd suggested that to a farm worker, you know, a, a year ago, a year and a half ago, he would have thought you were a little unbalanced. I think anybody would have thought you were a little unbalanced. Walk along the 99, you know, with a flag. <laughs> It took something really tremendous to keep the people walking along. There was this feeling of solidarity, you know. We have a right to be here. <laughs>
And so we watched Sacramento, and of course there were 10,000 people there. The governor wasn't there. But that didn't matter. It didn't matter, we were all there. And there was an added something. There was a knowledge you were going to win. Now for the real fun. Roberto, what does St. Patrick's Day mean to you? St. Patrick's, to me, I go back to Arizona, grade school. It means that if you're not, had green on you, somebody's going to pinch you. <laughs> and, and back there in, in Eloy, Arizona, in grade school, when they get a hold of you, they don't let go just like a pit bull, doesn't let go. They pinch until you get tears in your eyes. St. Patrick to me was that. But now, now that I, now that I know what happened in St. Patrick's Day, March 17, to me it means that's the day that I was down in one knee at six o'clock in the morning, tying my shoe, ready to start marching from the Leno to Sacramento. That's what March 17 means to me now. <laughs> You know, every year it comes around, oh, okay, this is where I was, you know, getting ready to start the march to Sacramento, March 17, 1966. That's what St. Patrick now means to me, <laughs> you know. How did you first hear about the, the march? Uh, and when you did hear about it, what was your reaction? Yeah. Cesar came to our meeting, the organizers meeting one night, there were 15 of us, and we were meeting, we meet every night. And the reason we were meeting every night was to discuss the daily activity, what went on that particular day. For example, how many people that we organized, how many people came out on strike, which ranch did we visit, you know, what problems we had with the grower and, and, and the police. So we were meeting that night and Cesar came in and says, guys, when you finish your meeting, I want to I wanna talk to you, I want to say something to you. But finish your meeting first and then I'll say something. And you know, that's what I like about the man. It wasn't one of those persons that come in and interrupted you. Yo soy el jefe, you know, I'm the boss. No, he would let you finish your meeting and then, you know, and then he said, okay, if, if, there, if you have time, then I'd like to say a few words. So we finished our meeting. Then I said, Cesar, go ahead. You have the floor now. What do you want to tell us? He said, guys, what do you think about <clears throat> going to Sacramento to go see the governor, to go protest, to go complain about the treatments and abuses by the growers and the police against the strikers and also about the farm workers, the workers that they work with them. And <clears throat> what do you think about going over there and, and complain to them so he can hear us? I said, hey, that's good, that's great, let's go, you know, let's go. We'll, uh, we'll get all the strikers together, all the families, we'll invite friends, we know, we'll get a caravan of cars and we can, you know, we can go out there. Well, how, you know, how far is it? Like, Three hour drive, we can leave at nine to 10 in the morning, caravan, you know, get there by one, one o'clock in the afternoon, go see the governor and come back at four or five to, you know, and, and come back in caravans, you know, you have a lot of people. And then, you know, even that little smirky smile, you can see that in the microphone, Caesar, he put his head down and said, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about a caravan. I'm not talking about driving to Sacramento. I'm talking about marching to Sacramento, walking to Sacramento. And we looked at each other and said, what? <laughs> I said, this man is crazy. <laughs> he wants us to walk and, you know, from Delano, Sacramento, 245 miles. He said, he wants us to walk 245 miles? Maybe all the pesticides in the grapes has affected his brain, you know? <laughs> but he said, think about it, guys, think about it. You know, we'll talk, we'll talk some more about it, but think about it. So he left us that night. And then we started talking about it. We started talking about it. We even started fighting among ourselves, you know. How could he want us to walk, you know, march to Sacramento? But that's how we started. That's how I, you know, learned about it. And then, I guess, history, you know, history was made because we walked to Sacramento. But that's how I, I found out about it. The, the march, uh, it was difficult to see it in the clips, but the march had three themes. They were on the, the, a lot of the, the signs that were carried 
during the course of the march. Those three themes are pilgrimage, penance, revolution. and revolution. Okay. How did you understand those, uh, those particular concepts? How were they, were they explained to you, what they meant, or what do you think they meant? What did you think? Yeah, about? well, it meant, you know, penance, um, the penance that we have been through, what we went through, revolution, you know, um, how would I put it? Uh, not, not, not as much as fighting, not, you know, fighting somebody, but that you had to do something about it, you know, to get ahead. And, and, and uh, justice, justicia, you know, we, hey, we want justice too, you know. That's to me what it meant. That's what I understood what it meant, you know. Well, who decided, or how was it decided, who would march and who would not march? Or d did everyone march? Well, it was, it was announced to everybody that uh, we wanted to go march. We had to go march. We got to go see the governor. And anybody who wants to sign up started signing up. We had over 300 people, 300 people signed up. But because of health reasons, older people, you know, uh, they couldn't go. Plus, we had to leave the picket line still going on in Delano. We still had a strike going on, and people had to stay behind to man, you know, the picket line and the strike. So it came down to 77 striking farm workers that enlisted, that agree, and those are the ones that were selected. So it was 77 that we started from Delano. But there was a whole bunch of people that wanted to go, but they couldn't. And what was the makeup of the marchers? I mean, men, women? We had, we had um, yeah, men and women. We had 10, about 10 women. The majority were men. The, the youngest was 18 years old, up to 63 years old. And that's what made up the, the 77 uh, strikers, uh, marchers, uh, peregrinos, as we call them, that made up the, the, the list. So yeah, we had women there. We had about 10 women marching with us. All races? All races, yeah, all races. We had uh, Filipinos, we had Mexicans, uh, we had blacks, you know, we, yeah, we had all races in there marching with us. And Anglos. Whites and Anglos, yeah, and, and white ones, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The proposed march route, you mentioned the actual distance from Delano to Sacramento is 245 miles, but everyone who participated in the march including me for three days at the end of the march. It's a hell of a lot longer um, that you guys marched than 245 miles. Now what, so what was the route? Well, we, th we thought it was going to be through 99, straight 99, 245 miles from Delano to Sacramento. That's what we thought. But no, Cesar wanted to take the scenic route <laughs> and go through the back road, the back side, to visit other farm worker communities and let them know what's going on, where we were going, and also invite them if they wanted to join us on the march. So we had to go through the back again, you know, through, I, you know, even now I see some of those roads that we used to go through, they're not there no more, you know. I said, we passed through here, how come there's no more road here? Now there's apartments and, and even prisons that are there, you know. But yeah, that was, that was the first thing we thought it was going to be straight, but no, let's go through the back of the scenic route, you know. And we visited every other, we went through 53 towns. We visited 53 towns, and half of those we stayed overnight. Mm -hmm. We stayed overnight of them. Mm -hmm. So that was the purpose, to go through the, through, through the farm worker community towns, let the people know that where we, you know, where we were going, why we, were, why we were going, and also to invite them. So yeah. So. Here, here's here's the memory question. How many of those farm worker towns can you name? <laughs> wow. <laughs> right now. Yeah. Right now. The first one was Ridge Grove. 
and then Ducor. That's the Ducor we stayed the first night, 18 miles. That's the one that's that the they, one mentioned, the video. they mentioned in the video. One farm worker, one house, one person, they say you can stay here. Only two or three people could stay inside the house. We stayed outside in the lawn. That's where we slept outside. But that was one house. That was Ducor. And then we went from Ducor, we went to Terra Vella, we went to Poroville, and then Lindsay, and Farmersville, Visalia, Dainuba, Reedley, Sanger, Selma, all those towns. And then going on to Sacramento. But those are some of the towns that we went through. And those, some of them, like I said, you know, we spend the night. Other one, we just passed through and we had, we had the breaks there and we had lunch there. But the main towns that we stayed overnight, that's where we had a rally, we had a meeting, and that's where we were telling people organizing about the union, what it was all about, why we were marching, why we were organizing, why we have to, you know, uh, ask for better wages and better working conditions and better treatments. So that's what, that's what the route was. You mentioned food. We, we yeah. stopped and ate there. I mean, you're marching. The food doesn't just, yeah. how did that happen? We had, uh, we had uh, an advanced crew, what we call three people up ahead, one day, two days ahead of us. And what they were doing is contacting the membership that we had. And back then, we didn't have a lot of membership because Cesar was barely organizing back then in 1962, 63, 64. But we were, not, we were notifying those membership or those members that the march is coming. The march is coming. It's going to be hitting your town such and such a day. They're going to be needing some water. They're going to be needing some food, anything you can help. They're going to be needing housing. So we had a a crew of three people ahead of us, you know, letting, letting people know. So that's how we were. We made it. And, and, and sometimes we went without no food <laughs> because there wasn't enough, you know, families to help us, you know. So that, that's how it was arranged at the beginning. And what about the logistics of the march itself? I mean, I saw you uh, there in the video. You were marching off to the right, right in the front. Um, who, who decided where the lunch stop or the breaks were? were going, was that your responsibility? Well, it was, it was uh, yeah, it was part of it. Uh, I, we had the route and we know which town we were going to be passing through because we were not going to stop at that town. And we were planning for the one that ahead, you know, that we're going to spend the night and ha have the rally. So yeah, we, we said, well, here we're just going to stop here for lunch or you know, take a break here, we'll sit in the road, and that's about it. But people, people start coming out, people start coming out and bringing us food, and water, and apples, and bananas, and you know, and any, any kind of fruit. And, and, and what we were noticing is families were getting together and, and, and planning something like a potluck, and they would put a table out there in the road, and then we were passing, we were just picking up you know, food as we went by, you know. So they started coming in and started helping us. The, the town Portoville, I like, I like to mention about uh, Portoville, which is a bigger town than Ducor and Terra Vella and, and, and the other ones at Risk Grove. We had music, the first music that greeted us, a family, a committee m met us there, they greeted us coming into town and they provided music. And that's what gave us a lot of energy, a lot of hope, a lot of, you know, hey, you know, they, they like us, <laughs> they want us, you know and they provided music. Plus, that group, those brothers, they joined the strike and they went with us on the strike and they played every day, every day, every night, every night they played music. Also, Portoville, let me tell you about Portoville again. A company in Los Angeles donated boots. They do donated a hundred pairs of boots to the marchers, to the peregrinos. So in, 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 in Portoville, everybody got a, a brand new pair of boots because we were marching with shoes. We are Sunday's best, you know? That's what we were marching with. And once we put those boots on, it's like stepping on clouds, you know? <laughs> Man, that helped a lot. They help a lot, you know? So yeah, they, you know, there were, there were towns that were, we were greeted, you know, with a lot of things that we needed. And other towns we just, went through and just wave at them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I didn't mention, uh, Leroy, about 
the problem we had at the beginning, leaving Delano. You know, we were there at five in the morning, getting ready. We had all everybody there sign up that was gonna go marching. We even had a 12 year old there. He wanted to go march. He said, what are you doing? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with you guys. I wanna march. No, you can't, <laughs> you know? You gotta go to school, you know? And, 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 and you know, Caesar was very, you know, about education. No, you, you send him to, back to school. But he, we had a 12 year old that wanted to go with us. And we said, no, I'm sorry, you can't go. You go to school. And we told the parent, get him to school, you know. But it, it, just as we were leaving the lane, or we were just making our turn, we were blocked by the police. Maybe you heard about it. 30 policemen came down real quick, real fast, parked their cars, got out of the cars with their riot gears on and their batons sticking out, you know, ready. And they blocked us. And, you know, I, I brought a little picture show, you know, when they blocked us, the road, they blocked us. They kept us there for two hours, almost two hours and a half. They said that we didn't have a permit for this parade. Parade? It's not a parade. It's a pilgrimage. It's a march. But they were saying it's a parade. No, you don't have a... And that's not true because we did get permission. We went to City Hall before, three days before that, and we told City Hall that we were going to be marching through the town. We were going to be passing through here. Do we have to sign something here? No, you don't have to sign. You know, you don't have to sign anything good. Just pick up your, your trash if you're going to, you know. But then, you know, Delano, they wanted us to leave town anyway, period. You know, they didn't want us there, you know. Go ahead and go and don't come back, you know. <laughs> but they blocked us for two and a half hours. And they, they, they were insisted about that permit, that permit, and we don't need a permit. And Cesar told them, well, if we can't march on, on the street, then we're going to march on the sidewalk. But I think what happened was that they, they dispersed after they got a call, I think, from Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was there three days doing, conducting hearings on un-American activities, and they were in Delano, and they finished on the 16th, and we marched on the 17th. I think he made a call and told you know, somebody, the chief of police, let my people go, or else <laughs> you're going to have a lawsuit. All of a sudden, they started dispersing, moving out, moving out, moving out. Then we said, okay, let's go. Then we started marching. But I think that's what, I think that's what happened that day. And those of us who are old enough to remember, and there's probably not many here, the Selma March and the Civil Rights Movement, the scene is almost identical where the police come out in riot gear, shoulder to shoulder, block the street, and their batons at the ready. And, and here, that many years later, in Delano, 1966, the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. Boy, did the press eat that up, huh? Yep. Ooh, wow. I also, Leroy, I also think that the growers, didn't want them, us to leave, so they told the police, block them. Because I think that once we left Delano, there's going to be a lot of publicity. A lot of publicity. You know, who are these people? Why are they marching? Where are they going? Because for many years or during that time, it was really hush hush in Delano about the strike that was going on. <coughs> Nobody knew about the strike. It was hush hush. There was no press, no TV, no newspaper, no, you know, no radio. Nothing was going on about the strike in Delano. It's not like we didn't have 5,000 workers out on strike. And that's, you know, and that's not right. So I think that they kind of, you know, hey, you better let them go, you know, or stop them, you know, because they're going to, there's a lot of publicity that's going to happen. So I think also that had to do with it, you know. Mm -hmm. As the captain of the march, what were your, like, daily duties? Well, make sure that everybody, let's go march, <laughs> you know. Uh, who's who's going to be carrying what cross, what flag, you know, we, we had to switch them. So they were kind of getting heavy, you know, heavy walking 10, 12, 15 miles a day and carrying a virgin you know, the American flag, the, the Mexican flag, and all the Union flags, and all the signs that we had. 
make sure that everybody was in, in line, make sure that everybody was in their positions, you know, and make sure that they understood the route, which one we're going, which road we're going to make a right or left, whatever, you know. Also, my job was to make sure that at the end of the day, who was going to, you know, uh, uh, the food was coming in or which home can, they can take one or two families for the night. So they gave me a list of families so we, you know, say, okay, let's have this couple go over there, this house, let's have this, you know, uh, women over here. So yeah, that was, uh, my, my job was to take care of uh, all the daily activity was going on. And every evening there was a presentation, a rally, huh? Yes, yes. What, what, what consist, what, tell us what the rally consisted of. Number one, it was, uh, it was uh, El Triato Campesino would do a skit, do a play about the strike, about the growers, about the labor contractors, how they treat people. Uh, it was a, a play they did every night. And after the play, after the, the skit, then Cesar would come in and talk about organizing, the, you know, about union, organizing, and, you know, any, any, and then all the songs that came along. So that's what every night we used to do that. When, you know, every night we would have a rally, uh, speeches, uh, people would come in and, and, and say something, or it, people that were invited, you know, we had guests to come and also invite and, and thank the, the, the marchers and so forth. But the main thing was, you know, the march, why, you know, and start getting ready, get organized, you know, start signing cards, ask for representation, and all the skids and the music. So yeah, every night we do that. And what I remember so vividly in the days that I participated in the march and attended that rally is that after the teatro performed their skits were which were really street theater, crazy stuff. It was great. Uh, then Luis, Luis Valdez, the one you saw in the, in the, the clip that did the narration, um, he, he proclaimed, he read the, Le plan, yeah. the, the plan of Delano. And that was a revolutionary firebrand speech about uh, the rights of workers, the rights of Mexicans, um, and three and, huh? yeah, the treatments, the yeah, treatments, yeah, how we were treated, justice, and, and all that, right, all that, and uh, and on the website, there's a good example. On the website, uh, there is a, an oral history. I think it's in the oral history section of Luis Valdez actually proclaiming the plan de, El Plan de Delano. And uh, um, what about injuries? What about, uh, uh, did people get hurt? How, uh, yeah. What happened? Yeah, well, thank God nothing serious really happened. Uh, yeah, there were blisters. <laughs> blisters galore, what I call them, you know. Uh, uh, every night uh, we had our nurse. We had a nurse with us, Peggy McGivern, and she was our nurse from the strike. And she went with us, and we converted a, an old station wagon into an ambulance type, you know, with all her medications and all that. And every night she would, you know, treat people with blisters. You know, Cesar got blisters, but also he sprained his ankle. The first night, the first day that we marched 18 miles, and, 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 and I remember that because after that two hours, two and a half hours delay, we had a rush, a little bit rush. We had to walk faster because it was getting dark. It was getting dark, it was getting dark, and we had to hit the town before, you know, we couldn't see we were walking, you know. It was out there in the boondock. But he, 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 he sprained his ankle, plus blisters. Yeah, we had blisters. There were blisters all over the place. And fevers, people had fevers, yes, you know. They had to sit out for one day, two days, you know, and then come back and walk again. And that's how Caesar got also better, because he started walking and walking and walking. And he had a cane one time, he was walking with a cane, but he got stronger and stronger and stronger, and he, and he did pretty good. And I remember Peggy, I remember Peggy one night, I would talk to her every day, how's it going, Peggy? How's it going, how's it going, everything, everything okay? Yeah, he said, Roberto, 
you won't believe this, but I had a nightmare. A nightmare, yeah, a nightmare. He said, I, was, I had this blister that I was treating, and it was huge. He made a big hand like that, <laughs> huge. And when I poked it, you know, with a needle, sterilized needle and alcohol, when I poked it, it came over me like a wave of an ocean, you know? <laughs> because she worked in so many blisters. <laughs> Every day she, she, she did a lot, she did a lot, and she, and she had a nightmare. One night it would just cover her, like a tsunami, you know? <laughs> we, were, I, we laughed about it afterwards, you know? I don't know where Peggy McGivern is. I hope she's, she's, she's okay, she's doing okay. I haven't heard from her. No, I haven't either. Yeah. No. no. But, but that's why we, ha we had a nurse that went with us. Yeah. Um, do, do you think the march accomplished its purposes in terms of making the strike known as you as you marched up the right. the valley? Do you know what I mean, was what evidence do you have that you? I think I think yes, it it, it did its, its its job. I think it did its thing. Uh, number one, we put Delano and the strike on the map. People knew about Delano. Who are these people again? Why are they marching? Where are they going? You know? And I think we did that. You know, we did that. And in the towns that we passed through, after talking to some workers, you know, because we were asking people, come on, join us, come on, join us, you know, sign the card here, come on and strike with us, you know? That every town, the growers knew that we were going to be passing through, that we left five cents, ten cents per hour. In each, in each of those towns because they it gave them a race, a race, mm -hmm. you know, so they won't, you know, hey, don't go over there, you know, I'll, I'll pay you some more, don't go over them, you know. I think we did, I think we did a lot, you know, in the, in the march. And, and number one was that, you know, that, that uh, put Delano and the strike on the map, but also all workers knew what was going on and they saw something, that the grower paid me a little bit more, but not to join. At one point in the march, Caesar asked permission to leave the march, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Yeah. He had, I believe, I believe as a, the, uh, the negotiations, you know, talking to some, some a grower that they wanted to talk to Cesar, wanted to talk to, that he had enough, and uh, you know, he wanted to talk. Do you remember which grower? Shandy, yeah. He was the first one to sign a contract with the union on, 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 on April the 6th, 1966. Yeah, he left because he wanted to go talk to them because they were calling him. They want to talk to him up and they want to sit down and, and negotiate. So that's what he did. That really was the first contract, right? Right, right. That was the first contract, yeah, Shanley Industries. Shanley Industries. Mm -hmm. Headquartered in New York, right? Right. Own, right. own what, 5,000 acres in uh, Delano? Delano, right. Wine grapes, right? Wine grapes, yeah. Wine grapes, yeah. Yeah, but we, you know, we, had, we had signs. We were carrying our signs, you know, boycott Chandley, boycott Chandley, you know. So people were getting, you know, when they look, you know, they saw TV, they saw the marches, they saw boycott Chandley, boycott Chandley, you know. Yeah, well, I think when the owner in New York looked at TV one night and he saw boycott Chandley signs going up, <laughs> Going up the Central Valley, I think, wow, what's, what's going on there? Yeah. But then Manetti was the other one, that, the, yeah. wine, the wine company. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Can you give us any examples, visual examples that you remember? The march started with 77 people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I could see from the, from the video that, you know, there were some, but, uh, some people joining the march. Right, whatever, whatever. right, right. How, Every, yeah. How, how, how long was the march in your, at some points? <laughs> well, from 77, every day, especially after the rally, the, the meeting that we had with, you know, with the town, people joined, people joined, people joined. Others joined us on the weekends. They went on, you know, Saturday and Sunday, they marched with us. But people started joining and joining, so the, the march started growing. And from 77, it came up to 100, 200, 300, 400, you know. I had seven assistants, seven monitors that were helping me, captains also, assistant captains, you know. 
and we started spreading, spreading ourselves, you know, hey, it, you take care of 50, and then spread out and take care of another 50, you know, and so forth. And then pretty soon there were 75, you, spread out, spread out, spread out, and then there was 100 people, wow, you know. And then we were marching in single file, and then two by two, and then three by three. So it grew, it grew, it grew, because people were joining. And then especially the ones that were coming in the weekends, they were joining the weekends. I can't I can be with you all day, but I'm going to join you on the weekends. Okay, do something, yeah. So that's how it started mm -hmm. growing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there were 10,000 people waiting in Sacramento when the march crossed the... Yeah. Well, you see the picture right there? That's, that's about 2,000 people right now marching. And when we got to Sacramento, but yeah, there was over 10,000 people there waiting for us. And people were marching with us, you know. What happened to you personally when you came across that bridge? I was given the key to the city <laughs> by, by the uh, uh, assistant mayor, uh, deputy mayor, because Governor Brown was not there. It was Governor Brown, guys. <laughs> you know which Brown? The father of Jerry Brown. You know, Edmund G. Pat Brown, you know, it was not the Jerry Brown. So, yeah, he wasn't there. So we said, it's okay. If he's not going to be there, it's okay. We're going to get there. We're going to knock on his door, you know, and which we did. You know, we went and we, after the Capitol, we knocked on the, on, the, on the wall, you know. But, yeah, I was, I was given the, the, the key to the city by the deputy mayor. And this is uh, the key that was given to me. I had the key for 40 years, held on to it for 40 years until three, four years ago. I donated it back or I gave it back to the Chavez Center. And it's out there in La Paz. Whenever you guys will see it, it's there. It has my name under it on behalf of the, of the peregrinos, the 77 marchers that went from Delano to Sacramento in 1966. So they gave me the key to the city. Yeah. I wish you could open the Bank of America. That was, <laughs> that was I said that at, at when, <laughs> when I spoke there, I said, I showed him the key. I said, I hope it opens Bank of America because Bank of America owned the Giorgio. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how were you set up to handle reporters and TVs and people who were coming to? Yeah. We had a, we had a press, press, uh, uh, group, you know, that were handling that. They, they would talk to reporters and so forth, you know. Um, uh, they're the ones who were taking all the information and then pass it on to the workers or to the strikers and so forth, you know. I would interpret, you know, anything that was happening, I would interpret in Spanish, you know, when anybody, a reporter would come in and wanted to know something, you know. But we had a, a press group, you know. Um, t Terry Cannon was... Terry Cannon, Terry yeah. Cannon was, yeah. Marshall Gans was there too, you know. Marshall Gans, yeah. 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 Terry Cannon um, um, was the editor of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee newspaper that was published out of, it was a national newspaper, but published out of San Francisco. Uh, and he was the editor. Um, and uh, they outfitted us, some van or something, and yeah, they had yeah. a phone in it. Uh, this was really makeshift. Uh, yeah. elementary stuff oh, yeah. In, the, yeah. in that era. But th they kept in communication with uh, all the, the media calling in. Uh, in those days, uh, UPI, United Press International, and Associated Press, International, uh, Associated Press were the major organs to disseminate right. um, about the farm worker movement. Uh, there were days uh, when every day just like clockwork, like around 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening, I would call AP to issue our daily release. And now this is not on the march, but this was after some of my work in Delano. Right. And I had a clipping service. I don't know why I did that. Maybe that's that uh, documentarian aspect to it. But mm -hmm. uh, I had a clipping service, and I was amazed at every month, six or 700 clips would come back from little podunk papers, big papers, magazines, all across the country, carrying 
my release or similar releases, you know, about the farm worker movement and what was happening and the latest crises or the latest victory or the latest defeat or whatever it was, or Caesar's fast or whatever we were doing at the particular time. But uh, I really understood the role of AP and UP. They, they just took it and they shot it on the wires and God knows who picked it up, but a lot of people picked it up. Um, was there a religious service every day of the march? Oh, yes. W w when was that? Before, <clears throat> before we start the march, there was, a, there was a prayer. At the end of the march, there was a prayer. So we had uh, a lot of priests in our, in, in our mar marching with us that they would conduct those prayers. Uh, so we had one every day, every day, every day, every day, every night, every night, every night. Before we even start, we had a prayer. Yeah, 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 we did that a lot. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, and why the Virgin of Guadalupe leading the march? What was that symbol? It was, it was it's in Mexico, it's, it's, uh, they're the ones that uh, uh, protect the workers. Uh, they're the ones that appeared to a farm worker also, you know, back then. And then, you know, so, Everybody knows it's the Virgen de Guadalupe, you know, the sacred and, and, the, and the protector of, of people, protector of, of, of poor people. So that's the one we carry to Sacramento. And those are the ones that we, we talked about, I talked about, you know, we had to switch over, you know, let somebody else carry it, because it was heavy. And it was heavy, the wind, you know. Yeah. And it was heavy, you know. Especially with some of the trucks were passing real close by, and you know. It kind of moved you, you know. And the 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 Virgin of Guadalupe was the the lead banner, right? right? Right. And then there was a cross, right? Right. Full size cross, right? Right. right. What about seven feet tall? Seven feet, big one, big yeah, one, big, yeah. yeah, yeah, big one, you know. Yeah. We had two people to carry it, <laughs> one holding it and one picking it up in the in, in the back, you know. And then the American flag, the Mexican flag, and then the Union, more Union flags, and then anybody who joined also, you know. Yeah. But that's where we had to set it up first, you know. And that's every day, every day, every day. There was a photographer, there were several photographers. Yes. There was one photographer in particular, um, John Lewis, now deceased, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, he, 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 he spent the entire year, he was a former Marine, he spent the entire year um, in Delano, photographing picket lines, strike, anything, everything, including the March to Sacramento. And I was always amazed. He, 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 had to, he had to do two marches because he would rush ahead yeah. of the march to get set up for shots that he wanted to take. You know, that, okay, fine, the march comes and then goes on by. And, and then he had to run to catch up with the march, you know, yeah. and then run ahead again and... Uh, and sometimes you'd see him uh, on a telephone pole, oh, hanging on, top on a telephone, of the telephone pole. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. And there were there were uh, a dozen photographers, but uh, John Lewis, uh, for my money, shot some of the most significant right. photos of the farm worker movement ever shot. Believe me. And uh, in fact, uh, in fact, Yale University acquired his entire portfolio just a few months before he died. Oh. Um, and and, and the, all of his work is housed at, um, at the Beneke uh, Library at Yale for, um, I forget the, the full name of the Beneke Library, but it's for manuscripts and um, uh, other things. And um, anyway, um, well, I, th I think that, uh, do you have any, any more about the march? And, no, I think we covered a lot, you know. Um, the purpose, why, you know, how many people. Um, we did okay. There was no serious, uh, you know. People ask me, what happens? Did anybody die in, in the march, you know? Like they want me to tell you, yeah, we put them there, and then we, in the way back we picked them up. <laughs> <laughs> and we picked them up and took them home, you know. <laughs> no, everything went you know, according, to, you know, according to, you know, to, yeah. to plan, you know. So there was no... Well, I, I tell you, you said it already. 
the march to Sacramento put the Cesar Chavez and his farm worker movement right. on the map, right. literally, and brought it to the attention of this entire country. Right. So, congratulations, Roberto. <laughs> you, you did a good job. Yeah. Thank you.